I started working on VR when I was 15 as a hobby because I was building PC gaming rigs and I had built a really, really nice PC gaming rig. And as I started planning out my next round of upgrades, it just wasn't exciting. And it was clear that the future of gaming was not going to be more monitors and more graphics cards and just, you know, incremental improvements. It was going to be something radically different. Palmer Lucky's story begins not in a boardroom, but in the cramped space of a 19-foot camper trailer, a place where a kid obsessed with gaming and sci-fi started building virtual reality headsets at just 15 years old. Oculus wasn't created to cash out. It was born from a belief that VR represented the inevitable endpoint of computing. VR was my hobby at the time. And so I started Oculus because I really liked VR and I wanted to make a run. I, I, had, I had a few good ideas for how to make a better VR headset and how to replace certain high-end hardware functions with much cheaper software functions, make it easy to use for game developers. Once you have perfect virtual reality, like that's it. The ability to simulate anything a human could experience or imagine experiencing, that's, that's the holy grail. That holy grail vision led to Oculus VR and soon after, one of the most high profile tech acquisitions in history. Facebook didn't just buy Oculus, it bought into Palmer's worldview. Mark was truly convinced that VR was the future. He saw what we were doing and he said, oh my God, this is the future of computing. This is the future of gaming. I truly believe in your vision. I want you to be a part of Facebook. So, ah, well, you know, we're not, not really that interested at this point, but like maybe we could team up in some way. And the thing that really convinced us in the end was two things. One, Mark promised not just to buy our company, but to invest a minimum of a billion dollars a year into research and development for the next decade. Mark changed the name of the company to Meta and literally made AR and VR the core of the company. Like In the end, Mark didn't acquire me, I acquired them. The funding was essential to ignite a healthy ecosystem of hardware, content, and developer support. Oculus needed billions and Facebook was the only company willing to back that scale. Oculus smashed its growth targets, hitting what they expected in five years in under two. Yet despite the success, Palmer's time at Facebook was about to implode, not because of VR, but because of politics. As a libertarian in the overwhelmingly left-leaning Bay Area, Palmer was a cultural outlier. Anyway, so look, Trump's running for president. I ended up giving $9,000 to a pro-Trump anti-Clinton group. And it's so funny because this started a media shit storm. I gave them $9,000. They ran one single billboard in, I think in Columbus, Ohio, that was a picture of Hillary Clinton and it said, too big to jail. And this was after she got away with mishandling classified information. You might remember at exactly the same time you had U.S. submariners being put in prison for decades for much less expansive mishandling of classified information. It was like, it was, it was a, an obvious double standard. So two things happened. First, the media found out about my contribution and a few media outlets reported on it somewhat accurately. Like Palmer Lucky, the guy who started Oculus, this Facebook executive, has given $9,000 to this pro-Trump anti-Clinton group that's running a billboard. Then a handful of people on Twitter, literally, it was a completely made up story, said Palmer is funding white supremacist internet trolls to attack Clinton supporters on the internet. It expanded from there. Palmer is funding anti-Semitic memes. Palmer is funding misogynist troll squads. Palmer is funding a tidal wave of racist memes on Reddit, Facebook, and beyond. It was literally fabricated. None of it ever happened. It was a completely false story. And it was reported by dozens of outlets. It's not even like there was like screenshots or made up screenshots. The journalists just said it was true with zero evidence and they just repeated what each other said. Palmer wrote a statement to correct the story, calling the coverage fake news. Facebook refused to let him publish it. As a result of this reporting, like looking back, I should have pushed back. What happened is I wrote a statement saying, hey, this is all false. None of this is true. Here's what actually happened. I gave $9,000 to this pro-Trump group. They ran a single billboard. Everyone is lying. This is literally fake news. Facebook told me I couldn't publish it. They said, we won't let you make this statement. You cannot make this statement because it frames the media as the bad guy. On March 29th, 2017, he was fired. Facebook insisted for years that it wasn't political. Only recently did a former CTO admit the official story was nonsense. The moment forced Palmer into a crossroads. Years later, I was fired from Facebook after donating $9,000 to the wrong political candidate. And that left me with a choice, either fade into irrelevance or build something that actually mattered. What mattered in Palmer's view was fixing a national security crisis hiding in plain sight. America's defense industry had drifted into stagnation. 
weighed down by bureaucracy, cost plus contracts, and an aversion to risk. Meanwhile, Silicon Valley had largely walked away from defense altogether. The biggest defense contractors had stopped innovating as fast as they had before, prioritizing shareholder dividends over advanced capability. The result, your Tesla has better AI than any US aircraft. Your Roomba has better autonomy than most of the Pentagon's weapon systems. And your Snapchat filters, they rely on better computer vision than our most advanced military sensors. Palmer founded Anduril to break that pattern. Not another contractor, a defense product company. The difference is fundamental. Build with your own money first, prove it works, and only then pitch it to government. We spend our own money building defense products that work rather than asking taxpayers to foot the bill. The result is that we move much faster and at lower cost than most traditional primes. Anduril Industries, an acronym for AI, built its entire product line around software, long before AI became the industry's hottest acronym. Well, Anduril is interesting because we're the AI company that kind of uh, preempted a lot of this AI hype. The, the name Anduril Industries, the acronym, the acronym is AI. And eight years ago, we couldn't even talk about that because AI was seen as this technology of the future, never something that was actually going to work. Now AI is the hottest thing ever. Look, AI powers all of our systems. The FQ44 has a lattice brain. Uh, the Ghost Shark has a lattice brain. All of our systems are running on our lattice AI brains that powers all of our stuff. Um, but I think that we're very different from a lot of these other AI companies in that AI is not the product. It's just the thing that makes the product work. I'm not selling AI software. I'm not selling an AI brain. I'm selling fighter jets. I'm selling submarines. I'm selling missiles. I'm selling heads up displays. I'm selling rifles. I'm selling force fields that happen to be powered by AI. By anchoring capability in software, Andril updates systems at the speed of code, not the speed of government paperwork. Andril builds fast because it bets big. They started constructing the factory for their FQ-44 autonomous fighter before the contract was even won, confident the military would need it. We started building that before we even won the contract. We've built these factories that are able to manufacture both of them at very large scale using largely autonomous manufacturing processes that are very simple to set up. We're designing products that can be made at scale at a price that is much cheaper than a lot of these legacy programs. The, the FQ-44, we went from selection to first flight in 556 days. That's the fastest a fighter program has moved in decades. The FQ-44A isn't remote controlled. It's an autonomous fighter that executes missions based on software-driven intent. And that speed is now being replicated overseas. Uh, with the Ghost Shark in Australia, we've in less than three years gone from the initial contract to real production robotic submarines coming off of our line in Sydney. That is extraordinarily fast. And I hope that the rest of the industry can kind of take notes from us and do things in a similar way. Andrew has even circled back to Palmer's VR roots. By taking over the Army's IVAS program, they're building AR headsets that give soldiers real-time shared situational awareness, effectively superhuman vision on the battlefield. We need all of our robots and all of our people to be getting the right information at the right time. That means they need a common view of the battlefield. Superhuman vision augmentation systems like better night vision, thermal vision, ultraviolet vision, hyperspectral vision, those are, those are the things that people focus on when they look at IVAS. Uh, but there's a whole nother layer, which is that we need to be able to see the world the same way that robots do if we're gonna work closely alongside them on such high stakes problems. Why the rush? Because the strategic landscape has changed. Nations like China can outproduce the United States by sheer volume. Palmer argues America can't match China's numbers, but it can outpace them with autonomy. At our core, we're about fostering peace. We deter conflict by making sure our adversaries know they can't compete. Putin invaded Ukraine because he believed that he could win. Countries only go to war when they disagree as to who the victor will be. That's what deterrence is all about. Not saber rattling, making aggression so costly that adversaries don't try in the first place. And that deterrence, he insists, requires AI. Today, China has the world's largest navy with 232 times the shipbuilding capacity of the United States, the world's largest coast guard, the world's largest standing ground force, and the world's largest missile arsenal with production capacity growing every single day. We'll never meet China's numerical advantage through traditional means, nor should we try. What we need isn't more of these same systems. We need fundamentally different capabilities. 
We need autonomous systems that can ex augment our existing manned fleets. We need intelligent platforms that can operate in contested environments where human piloted systems simply cannot. We need weapons that can be produced at scale, deployed rapidly, and updated continuously. This is where AI comes in. AI is the only possible way we can keep up with China's numerical advantage. We don't want to throw millions of people into the fight like they do. We can't do it, and we shouldn't do it. AI software allows us to build a different kind of force, one that isn't limited by cost or complexity or population or manpower, but instead by adaptability, scale, and speed of manufacturing. The ethical debate around autonomous defense is complex, but Palmer argues the debate isn't about opening Pandora's box. It opened decades ago. We, we shouldn't open Pandora's box. And my point to them is the, the Pandora's box was opened a long time ago. With anti-radiation missiles that seek out surface air missile launchers, we've been using them since pre-Vietnam era. Our destroyers, Aegis systems, are capable of locking on and firing on targets totally autonomously. Almost all of our ships are protected by close-in weapon systems that shoot down incoming mortars, incoming missiles, incoming drones. I mean, like we, we, we've been in this world of systems that act out our will autonomously for decades. And so uh, the point I would make to people is uh, you're, you're not asking to not open Pandora's box. You're asking to shove it back in and close it again. And the whole point of the allegory is that such cannot be done. Uh, and so that's, that, that's the way that I look at it. Palmer Lucky went from reshaping entertainment to fired from Facebook to reshaping defense, powered by the same belief in speed, software, and product-driven innovation. Andrew's rise reflects a simple conviction. The people defending a nation deserve the best tools available, not yesterday's technology. Our defenders, the men and the women who volunteer to risk our lives, deserve technology that makes them stronger, faster, and safer. Anything less is a betrayal, because that technology is available today.